recession is numerically defined. General definition, two or more consecutive quarters of declining GDP. So one bad quarter, okay, but you have two, that's a recession. A few other bells and whistles, but that's about it. And we have a group called the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge, and they, they're the referees. It's a private group. When they say it's a recession, it's a recession. They say it's over, and that's widely accepted. And so you say, well, depression, depression sounds worse than a recession. So if a recession is two quarters of declining GDP, a, re- a depression must be 10 quarters of declining GDP. In other words, it's like a really long, bad recession. And that's not the definition. They, that can happen happen. That's, that's actually quite rare. But a depression is a, a very extended period of depressed growth. I mean, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend, it's below potential. In other words, it's depressed growth. And for that matter, you could, I think you can make a good argument, and I do, that the period from 2009 to 2019 had depression-like characteristics because, okay, that was a 10-year growth period. It was the longest sustained expansion in U.S. history. But average annual growth for the whole 10 years was 2.2%. And it clustered around that. There was never a 3% year during the whole 10 years. Uh, It never went negative after 2009. But, you know, it might have been 1.8 or 2.7, but it clustered around 2.2 and the average was 2.2. Well, for all expansions post-1980, the average in the United States is 3.2. So right there, we're a full percentage point below trend. And if you think 1% doesn't sound like a lot, you apply 1% to a $20 trillion economy compounded over 10 years, you're talking about $4 trillion of lost wealth, $4 trillion of wealth left on the table. Now, that was during an expansion. Now, bring that forward to today. My estimate is that we're in a second recession right now in the United States. That is, we had Europe, certainly. Uh, so we had a technical recession in the first half of 2020, two consecutive quarters, down 5% in the first quarter, down 31% annualized in the second quarter. Then we had strong growth in the third quarter. Uh, fourth quarter, we won't know the number for a few more days, but it looks you know, okay, but not great. Uh, but the point is you're working off a very low base. Uh, you know, So we're sort of down 31% in the second quarter and up 33% in the third quarter. And everyone says, well, doesn't that get you back where you were? And the answer is no, because the 33 is off a much lower base. It's 33% of a lower number. But I make the point that you know the S&P 500, which is the major index, should actually be called the S&P 7 because there are seven stocks bringing the whole index along. And we know what they are. It's Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft, Netflix, and Tesla. Those seven stocks, could, because the S&P 500 is what's called a cap-weighted index, your, your influence on the index is based on your market capitalization. Well, those seven stocks are 40% of the capitalization of the entire S&P 500. So if they go up, the index goes up. More people buy it, it goes up more. More people buy it, it goes up more. So it's sort of a recursive function, but it's it has bubble dynamics. I wouldn't say go out and short it because uh, it's like getting run over by an 18-wheeler going 70 miles an hour. I don't want to stand in front of that yelling stop, but I look at it, I step back and look at it. It does have a bubble dynamic to it, but you know it'll, it'll go its own way. But the point is that has nothing to do with the real economy. I've never seen the stock market so detached from the real economy. So so people kind of look down their noses, they'll look at a, a restaurant and say, all right, you've got 20 wait staff and uh, uh, bartenders and you've closed, uh, but you know that's only 20 people and um, uh, you know, you'll reopen, get hired back. And no one seems to care. Well, first of all, I care. And I guarantee there's 20 people who are out of work care. But analysts who say things like that are missing a couple of things. Number one, that restaurant may not reopen. It may, it may not be a matter of three months or four months or whatever, and then you reopen your doors. They're, they're gone. They're closing up walking away from leases, selling their equipment at fire sale prices, the jobs are permanently lost. You know, maybe they'll open another restaurant in another state someday. They're entrepreneurs, but not yet. That restaurant's gone and those jobs are gone, number one. Number two, it it may be a small enterprise individually, but in the aggregate, those small and medium-sized businesses are 50% of all the jobs in the United States and 45% of GDP. So uh, you're locking down half the economy or at, at best, greatly reducing capacity. So if you take half the economy and cut capacity and half by half, let's say, you've shut down 25% of your economy. How do you do that without a recession? Well, the answer is you can't. So the the aggregate is huge. And again, the stock market will go its way, although um, it seems to have hit a little bit of an air pocket uh, in the last couple of days. But the real economy is suffering. Uh, Many of those jobs are permanently lost. And then the ripple effects that take time to play out. So you shut a restaurant. Well, then they don't pay the lease. They break the lease. Well, what happens to the landlord? Well, if he's not getting rent, how does he pay the mortgage? 
And what happens to the mortgage? Well, it goes into arrears. And then that falls on the bank, except the banks have packaged these into commercial mortgage-backed securities and sold them to you and me. So, you know, look in your 401k account in the US or any kind of superannuation account or savings account in the UK. And don't be shocked if you find, uh, you know, some commercial real estate mortgage-backed fund that was sold to you by some broker uh, that's actually going to perform very poorly based on what I'm saying. So this could take a full year to play out. Um, I did another interview recently and it was a major hedge fund. And they said, Jim, you follow the Fed closely. What is the Fed doing? What is the, what's your forecast? I said, I do follow the Fed closely. And my answer is that they're impotent. Uh, they have no role. You, you can see what they're saying, but it doesn't matter. Rates are at zero. They're going to stay at zero. As far as the eye can see, money printing does not work because there's no lending and spending. There's no what's called velocity. So the Fed prints $7 trillion, gives it to the banks in payment for bonds, puts the bonds on the balance sheet. The banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. The money doesn't make it to the real economy. It just sits there. And so I tell people, uh, you know, you don't need to get beyond fifth grade in math. Uh, $7 trillion times zero is zero, meaning uh, you can have all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and spending part is psychological and it's out of the Fed's control. You've got to basically change inflationary expectations. There's only one way to do that. And I talk about that at the end of my book, and that's to raise the price of gold. Um, now, you refer to his $1.9 trillion stimulus package. That's what the Biden administration calls it. I call it deficit spending. In other words, it is deficit spending. The money is going out the door. It's real money, but it will not have a stimulative impact. Why? The answer is that the money, uh, at least to the extent it goes to individuals, you know, $1,400 per household check, et cetera, people don't spend it. They're going to save it or they're going to pay down debt. But economically, paying down debt paying down bills is the same as savings. In other words, you're shrinking your balance sheet. You're not buying a new car or a new refrigerator or new clothes or whatever. And the, the evidence is there. The U.S. savings rate has skyrocketed. If stimulus programs work, then why isn't the economy in better shape than it is? Uh, and in, in last April, the U.S. savings rate was 33%. Last May, it was still as high as 17%. And in June, it was still over 10%. Normally, 5% is considered kind of normal in the U.S. 8% is considered high. And now you've got these Chinese levels of savings, you know, 33%, 20% as the case may be. So what it shows is that you know, just as money printing is not leading to any velocity, handing out money, deficit spending, in other words, is not turning into consumption. It's turning into savings. Now, savings individually, it can be a good thing. I'm not anti-savings. And uh, certainly people, if you've lost your job, you're going to be saving. You're not taking your friends out to dinner. Even if you haven't lost your job, you're probably looking around, maybe your spouse uh, lost his job or your neighbor lost his job or your thinking, well, I still have my job, but maybe my company will shut down next week. And so I'm going to save, even though I still have my job, I'm going to save just in case. Economists call this uh, precautionary savings, saving for a rainy day, if you want to put it that way. And that's what people are doing. If you're out of work, you're saving. If you're not out of work, you're worried and you're saving. And so those checks will not have that effect. But on a more big picture level, What's going on here? There's very good evidence, a lot of it by a number of academics, that when debt to GDP ratios, what's the national debt divided by GDP? When that ratio gets to 90%, the Keynesian multiplier goes below one. And the, so the Keynesian multiplier says, if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar twenty of GDP or a dollar ten of GDP because of the turnover, because of the velocity that we talked about earlier, and that's true up to a critical threshold, up to a level, and that level is, appears to be about ninety percent. Beyond ninety percent, what happens is the Keynesian multiplier goes below one, which means now you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get ninety cents of GDP or you get 80 cents of GDP. In other words, you don't even get your dollar back. Now, what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? That's a, it's a fraction, right? So as you borrow the dollar, the, the numerator goes up by a dollar, but if the Keynesian multiplier is less than one, the denominator goes up by less than a dollar. So what's happening to the ratio? It's going higher, because when you expand the numerator faster than the denominator, the percentage goes up. Well, we, I said 90% was a critical threshold. Before the pandemic, the United States was at 106%. So we're already in trouble. Along comes the pandemic. So the denominator shrinks because we had a recession. The numerator expands because we've had multi, multiple multi-trillion dollar bailout packages, the 1.9 trillion you mentioned. And you're right, Shay, that's just the latest. We already had 3 trillion in 2020 and a, a trillion dollar year baseline deficits and a $900 billion year package last month. So you're looking at seven or eight trillion dollars of debt over fiscal 2020, fiscal 2021. So pile that in the numerator. So now the ratio is about 130 percent. 
So who's at that lunch table? Well, it's Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. Those are your, those your, there's your lunch table. Uh, those are the other countries, the super debtors that are in the same shape. And so, um, um, so we're at a state now where you cannot print your way out of the crisis because of velocity, and you cannot deficit spend your way out of the crisis because the Keynesian multiplier is less than one. So you can print all you want, spend all you want, but you won't get any growth or you won't get commensurate growth. Uh, and there's no way out of this. This is a debt death spiral that always ends in one of three places, default, uh, inflation or higher taxes. We're not going to default because we actually can print the money. Um, so take that off the list. Inflation is a solution. If you inflate enough, you can melt the real value of the debt. Higher taxes won't work because that'll slow growth even more. So inflation is the only way out. The problem is central banks don't know how to get inflation. Although I tell the reader in uh, the conclusion of my book exactly how to do it. There's, there's a little recipe. You can do it yourself. But uh, I don't know how many central bankers are going to read it and take it to heart. 